Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to our, our May deep dive with DUI. Um, today is, uh, I guess it's the beginning of the dive season for most of the places around the, around the world, um, except for maybe where our guest is speaking from. Uh, the season <laughs> maybe hasn't quite started yet. Um, started. So today, what? <laughs> sorry. It started. Um, it started? Okay, good. No, we're, not, we're not that far north. <laughs> Um, so today we have uh, Jeremy Laplante from Boutique du Plonger Saguenay. I'm, I know I butchered that. I'll, I'll give you a pass on the pronunciation. <laughs> so um, I'm sure he'll say it the correct way as we go through this. Um, but we're, he's going to be presenting on diving Saguenay and the St. Lawrence River. Um, so with that, I just want to remind people that we are streaming this and I should be recording this locally on the computer. So I remember to do that. So uh, this is all being uh, streamed live on Facebook at this time. Um, so if you're watching on Facebook, also note that uh, you can watch this via um, the Zoom presentation where there's a little more interactivity to it. Um, but please post or uh, uh, post your questions that you want answered throughout the presentation. We'll try to get to those as as often and as content appropriate as we can. Um, so with today, also note that it's best viewed, uh, viewing this in the speaker view. And with that, let's get going. So I'm going to unspotlight myself and I'd like to welcome Jeremy uh, today. And let me see, make sure you are spotlighted. There you go. Um, so welcome. Um, and I'm just going to open up this up with a quick question. I'd just like you to introduce yourself, uh, say <laughs> all this stuff correctly <laughs> with the pronunciation. And then I, uh, just a general thing for all the viewers out there is um, when you start diving, you know, what, what made it so you have this passion for diving? What, what just gets you excited about diving? So this is kind of like a side question with the, with the whole thing. So obviously diving where you're diving, but. Thanks, Jack. Thanks for uh, having me over today. And uh, hello, everybody. Hope you're all doing really good today. Um, so I'm, my name's Jeremy. I'm with uh, Boutique Plongeur de Saguenay. And yes, that's French. It basically means Saguenay Diver Dive Shop. And to answer your question, it's, Basically, apart from you know, all the, the, the technical aspect of diving, I enjoy um, the gear is fun too. But what I, I love most about diving is just losing myself underwater. I think it's such, it's the closest thing you get to exploring another planet. You know, whether you're, you're hovering off the side of a, you know, a cliff in the Saguenay and there's several hundred feet of water below you um, to, you know, looking at all these, these creatures underwater that like totally could not exist on land or, you know, I think it's, you know, it's the closest thing you're going to get to, you know, ex experimenting what, you know, an astronaut landing on another planet would feel like, you know, when you're in these movies like Pandora or, or on um, like an avatar, it's just the really cool aspect of, of diving I enjoy. It's kind of like one of those questions. I mean, cause um, I dive quite a bit in San Diego. It's kind of nice having um, the ocean right in my backyard. So go diving after work and on the weekends and San Diego, we do get a lot of tourists and, and people are always like, oh, as you're walking out of the door, did you see a shark? And I'm like, well, yeah. And then they're like all freaked out and you're like gone. And the thing is, I, I find that so many people just don't know what's below the water and they get so nervous and anxious about what they're not seeing until they mm -hmm. actually are able to go and explore underwater. And then, then that fascination just, you know, just grabs them, you know, it's like, oh, it's not so bad underwater. That's, that's actually cool, <laughs> you know, so. I enjoy yeah, sharing totally that with people. Is. Like, yeah, I'm always taking like my you, camera and showing it. The the... Oh, go ahead. It's probably the same thing world over. If you're diving anywhere where there's non-divers, you probably have to plan like a 10, 15 minutes extra, you know, pad time, your pre-dive just to answer questions. You know, the famous question, like, are you diving or um, what do you guys see down there? <laughs> right. Did you see anything cool today? Um, so that's yeah. where I, I now I figured out how to do preview on my camera. So I'm sitting there trying to show them all this while I've got all this weight. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'll show you for some photos. I always 
take the time for the kids though for sure you know they always mm -hmm. like seeing like the octopus pictures and stuff like that so no, okay sure. so so what do you have for us today so today we're going to talk about diving in the uh Saguenay primarily in the Saguenay also in the St. Lawrence River with a little bonus at the end so let's start like this with my new favorite mode of presentation in Zoom. So you get to watch the slideshow and you can watch my ugly mug too at the same time. <laughs> so this is a, so we're diving the Saguenay in the St. Lawrence. So the first question people often ask is, you know, where is that? Short answer is if you're somewhat familiar with um, Canada and Quebec, it's roughly five hours north uh, northeast of Montreal, about two hours north of Quebec City. Now I've got a little video here that uh, took me about a, you know, 45 minutes to do on Google Earth. If Jack wants to, oh, wants to start it. I'm already missing my cue. Hang on. <laughs> yeah, there we go. So if, if we take the Great Lakes, like pretty much anybody who dives around North America know where the Great Lakes are. And uh, the Great Lakes are a start of, you know, the whole, the, the, the whole trip that the, the water's going to take. So the Great Lakes are right in, in the screen here. And it, at the end of the Great Lakes of Lake Ontario, well, that's when it, we get into the river and it, you know, eventually becomes the St. Lawrence River, you know, st stretching you know, over a thousand kilometers and, you know, past, you know, the Ontario, Quebec, border, uh, Ontario, US border into Quebec, around Montreal, around C Quebec City. And a couple hundred kilometers past that, well, we get this, it joins up with this great big river. And that's the whole Saguenay and Lac Saint-Jean area. We're going to do a more detailed overview in a few minutes. And the Saguenay is a fjord. And like pretty much most fjords in the world, it's basically got cliff on either side. It's a bit over 100 kilometers long. It's an, actually a national park. It's a jointly operating national park between the provincial and federal government uh, with both, you know, about the entirety of the fjord and, you know, either sides uh, you have, you know, hiking trails and whatnot. And the after, you know, like I said, a bit over 100 kilometers, you end up joining to the St. Lawrence River and right now you're really what in what they call the upper estuary so this is really it's not the St. Lawrence River that you're used to if you live around Cornwall or if you live around Montreal this is you know 100% salt water it's a tidal river uh, it ranges from you know about 60 kilometers right wide to a couple hundred kilometers wide and we're mainly going to be focusing on the north shore today and the St. Lawrence River eventually you know leads you all the way out to uh, you know, the Gulf of St. Lawrence, uh, the Maritimes, and eventually the Atlantic Ocean. So it gives you a little bit of an overview of where we're, we're situated on, uh, on the North American continent. Here, Jack, you want to give me my screen back, please? Thank you. Oh, I've got to share this again. Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry. When I, <laughs> I jumped on top of your screen, Sherry. There we go. Okay, so so that we did that. And um, yeah, so like I said, it's a fjord and like pretty much every single fjord in uh, the world, it's got, it's got like really big cliffs on either side and those actually continue below the water. And so if you wanna be able to visualize roughly how deep the fjord is, you just look at the portion that's above the water and you've got roughly that same amount underneath the surface. So it's a, it's a fairly deep area. Uh, the maximum depth is right around a thousand feet. And what's special with this fjord though, is that it's actually fed from both ends. Um, so on the Western side, the Northwestern side, we have Lac Saint-Jean, which is this big, somewhat artificial lake. It was naturally, it's much smaller than that, but they dammed it and it became uh, much bigger. And that's it's like, it's a lake, so it's, it's fresh water. And this gradually feeds through the, um, the Saguenay River into the Saguenay Fjord, which is this, the thicker portion we see right here. And on the eastern end, we have the St. Lawrence River, and that's salt water. And that feeds in as well with uh, the current depending on the tide. So if we have uh, the tides coming up, the current wants to come in. If the tide's coming down, well, we're going to have the current's going to want to 
at least from the saltwater portion, is going to want to go back out into the river. And if we look at a, what it looks like underneath the water, it gives us this interesting dynamic where we have like this thin layer of uh, fresh or brackish warmer water, depending on what time of the year we are. And most of the, the water in the fjord is actually cold salt water from the uh, St. Lawrence estuary. Uh, so each time you have you know, a big variation in the temperature, we have thermoclines. Each time you have you know, a big variation in salinity, we have haloclines and we get to have both at the same time where we have a thermal halocline. So depending on what time of the year you're diving, you have sometimes 10, 15 degree difference. Uh, those would be Celsius. Um, between you know this fresh water and the um, the salt water and it makes it's almost like looking through a frosted uh, bathroom window so you know you, you can dive in the water and you're thinking oh this water is not too bad and then you know you go down 30 40 feet and then you hit that thermal halocline and the water drops down to maybe 38 40 degrees fahrenheit if it's a warm day and uh you know it's like getting a nice little punch in the face. <laughs> don't worry, after a few minutes, you don't feel your face anymore, so it's it's fine. <laughs> That's a warm day? <laughs> yeah, it's a warm day. Well, it's, 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 it's salt water, right? So the coldest you're gonna get at that level of salinity is roughly minus two degrees Celsius. So it's like 28 degrees in like freedom units. So it's, uh, it, can, it can get pretty, pretty cold during the winter. Usually the, during the summer when most of our diving season is, it's like around the four degree mark. Sometimes, you know, a bit colder, but it rarely goes below, you know, two degrees. So right around maybe 34, 35 degrees Fahrenheit. And so underwater, what we get is, uh, so you can see it's pretty steep, it goes down to about a thousand feet. There's a few areas at the beginning of the fjord where if I just move my head out of the way here, uh, we have like these underwater mountains and you don't, they're too deep for most of, we're not actually gonna see them underwater, they're too deep. Uh, but what you they do make, they make for some um, interesting uh, vertical currents. So there have been a phenomenon of vertical waves of underwater waves between the actual um, fresh water and the, uh, the salt water. So if you guys want to like to read up on that. So, so is that more like a, a downwelling type of thing or, or an upwelling like where there's just a current yeah, that's it's, pushing it's in much, that direction? Think of it as a wave. It's like it's actually kind of like the picture they drew here. Um, but it's much slower than the way a wave would, you know, crest and crash on mm -hmm. the surface. But there are these, you know, interesting currents you hit sometimes, but most of the time the current is um, uh, basically uh, horizontal, where we have in fresh water, you know, a general tendency of going from, you know, towards the St. Lawrence River. And in the salt water, it's going to be much more dependent on the tides. And we can have roughly up to 20 feet of tide when we have the big full moon tides during fall. So, I mean, it's, you know, we can have some nice, you know, some nice currents. So if we continue on, um, there's two kinds of diving we do. There's shore diving and there is uh, boat diving. Shore diving, if you remember from the previous pictures, well, we can't just chuck ourselves off the side of a thousand foot cliff. Um, so we actually have to pick our spots really carefully because we need to have an area where we can actually naturally access the water in, in a safe manner. So there's really only four spots where we, which we dive. So the um, the uh, first one, if we look at here, oh, let me just change the slides here. And you're gonna notice between, they, they all look somewhat the same because we're not the only ones who need access to that water. So they're all generally where we have boat ramps. So the first site is called Anse de Roche, which is right around here, which is the closest site to the, uh, the St. Lawrence River. After that, we have Petit Sagné, which is another uh, a boat ramp. We have Lance Saint-Jean right here, which is also where we launch the, uh, our boat to go boat diving. And the last one is actually St. Rose Nord. And this is the most popular one because it's, it's about half an hour drive from, from around here. So it's the closest one. It's also mainly because of that. And it's also because it's, it's got a nice wall, which is quite close to the uh, point of entry. And it makes for a nice introduction to, uh, to the Saguenay diving uh, for somebody who's never dived in these conditions. So we like organizing trips, especially we're doing like advanced open water checkout dives uh, around like around this area, since it's, it's convenient, it's, it's well mapped out, it's well known, it's, it's, it's a nice area, it's a nice dive too. 
So it's pretty easy access for doing training. Yeah, the, the access is actually really easy. It's always boat ramps, right? So you're walking down, just picture, you know, a standard boat ramp and you just walk down that. And uh, you walk up, they have, they've actually set up a little area for divers. We have a hose to a hose off for gear because it is, even though it's fresh water at the surface, we are diving in salt water. And just that, you know, just transiting through the fresh water layer at the surface is not enough to, uh, to really rinse out your gear correctly. So like we have a nice little setup here. If we carry on all of the, you know, the shore diving is nice, but it's actually, it only gives us a really limited, uh, you know, pick, like pick point of view and unlimited access to the difference area in the fjord. When we dive with the boat, well, then we have access to virtually all of it. Not quite all of it. This little area here shouldn't be in a red because that's actually a little reserved for belugas and we're not allowed to go there with boats. But most of it is, is we're pretty much accessible. And those are really the nicest dives you can do in the Saguenay. That's where you're going to see, you know, the most, uh, biodiverse areas. That's where you're going to see also, you won't actually have to swim back to the point of entrance because the boat can just follow you. So that's always a nice perk too. And if we look at, you know, most of the pictures we're going to see today and the videos, they're actually taken from the boat dives. And like, if you really want to be able to experience the, the fjord hundred percent, you really want to come, you know, with us on the boat. So what's it like when we're actually diving in the water? So we have this freshwater layer on the surface and it's basically, you know, it's, uh, it's very sediment rich. It's very uh, tannin rich that comes from basically all of the, 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 the lake, from all the streams, all the rivers that feed into the, uh, into the lake. Uh, and it's got this brown color, which is, you know, quite common to many uh, rivers in North America. Visibility can range from couple of inches to fairly decent depending on the time of the year. You see in the picture here it's we have the typical brown color but the visibility is actually pretty nice. Uh, regardless of the visibility in the fresh water by the time you get to the salt water um, it's generally completely dark regardless of time of day. So but the visibility greatly improves so it can range from on a really bad day it'll be a couple of feet but generally we're talking you know 20, 30, 40, 50 feet and up. So practically speaking, generally you're going to see as far as your diving line can can shine. And uh, the salt water is much more biodiverse than the fresh water, so that's where we're gonna uh, we're gonna focus most of the diving. We're really just transiting through the fresh water. It actually makes a, it makes for a nice safety stop because usually the uh, the 20 foot safety stop is in fresh water, and that one's a is noticeably warmer. And if we're doing any tankle diving, that last 20 foot 20 foot of the 10 foot stops are also, you know, in considerably warmer water. So that's always a nice little bonus. So where's but the salt water want it. layer usually start again? Um, Sorry? What, depth, what depth is the salt water layer usually? It depends on the, uh, the, the time of year. Like right now, since uh, like we're just at the end of the spring, we've had all the snow melt, uh, lots of rain because springtime again. Sometimes the fresh water can be up to 80 feet, you know, thick, the freshwater layer. Usually though, by the time like the real diving season starts and the conditions are much nicer. So usually we're gonna to come to that, you know, a bit later in the presentation. We're talking about uh, 30 roughly feet, give or take a few. Okay. So it's not really that thick. You, by the time you hit 40, 50 feet, you're, you know, well into that salt water layer and that's where all the nice start stuff starts to be, uh, to be found. So what do we see? Well, there's tons of stuff. The fjord is actually really biodiverse. We have over 500 observable species. We won't, can't all see them as divers. Sometimes they're, uh, they're just too deep or they're in the middle of the fjord and we're generally closer to the walls. But we have a bunch of crustaceans. So if you like macro, we have skeleton shrimps uh, all the way up to the uh, various uh, species of shrimps that are up to about roughly four inches in length, um, hermit crabs and the snow crabs, which can be a couple of feet in diameter. Uh, we, are, we have octopus too, not a bit smaller than the, you know, the Pacific octopus. They're about, you know, the size of a, yeah, a quarter. <laughs> so they're, they're quite small. So it's the North it's Atlantic tiny. octopus. At most they'll get it maybe a couple inches in diameter. They're, they're mostly quite small. And probably the official mascot of the Saguenay is the bobtail squid, which as you can see, is quite small. I'll give you an idea of what they're usually 
how big they are. That's uh, basically uh, an extra large Smurf glove. Wow. Although they can get much bigger. You can see that's that little one right there and it's beside a somewhat larger one. Although that one, you know, you, we usually don't see them that size. It's, um, so we have a whole bunch of uh, different kind of um, uh, anemones stock jellyfish uh, like these. And uh, we actually have lots and lots of people actually, you know, it's generally associate cold water diving with uh, bland colors. Uh, but like I saying, we have as many colors as you can see, you know, what you see in a coral reef. It's just that, you know, the water is much colder. So, you know, vibrant shades of purple, green, orange, pink, uh, you know, we, we, we pretty much have it all. Just need to bring a bright light. <laughs> yeah, you just have to bring a bright light and a, and a good dry suit. We also have uh, jellyfish. The, the ones that steal the show are the lion's manes. So they come usually uh, at the end of the season and the lion's mane jellyfish can like if you, in the ocean, they, they can reach up to, the, the bell can reach up to three feet in diameter, or sometimes even larger. Ours tend to be a bit smaller than that, but you can count on the nice specimens having a bell. It's roughly, you know, a foot, maybe a bit more in diameter. And they're really, the tentacles can be, you know, tens of feet long. They're really, you know, graceful creatures to, um, to look at underwater. And they're one of the few creatures that are actually gonna venture in the fresh water too. So they can, they can, that'll give you something to look at while you're doing your, your safety stop or your, your deco stop. And nudibranchs. We have roughly 20 species of nudibranchs uh, and of varying sizes, ranging from you know, the typical one inch nudibranch to some that are close to a foot long. Right here, if you look at the diver for reference. So that's not quite a macro shot. Um, no, that's not quite a macro shot. Like usually you think people think of nudibranchs as, you know, needing to, having, needing to have a, a macro lens, but that's not really the case. Yeah, um, we have. Although I like, what's that? No, I'm, I'm looking at that. That's like one that we have um, right now going on in La Jolla Shores, but uh, at least a quarter of that size is, <laughs> but it looks similar. Yeah, it's uh, that that one's kind of big though. Like I, I'd be lying if if I if I if I was saying they're all that size. No, that one's been is has has been fed. <laughs> <laughs> it's um one of the my probably one of I wouldn't say my favorite one of my favorite things to look at in the Sagnier comb jellies. Uh, like sea girls berries are basically they look like a small small jellyfish. Uh, they don't have like this pulsating swimming movement. They actually have a bunch of, uh, of cilla on their side. So little, little hairs that basically undulate and that's how they uh, move around in the water. And some of them, instead of having uh, tentacles with, with somatocysts, so stinging cells, they actually have these little, basically um, little drops of glue and that's how they capture their prey. But the cool thing is that if you, when you shine your light on them, like you can see on this picture right here, the, um, they basically refract light and they and they they have really 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 nice colors. You can see a shot right there. And they basically feed off the plankton. You can see that one. This is a macro shot. You can see that one's got a little uh, little shrimp there. And once they've eaten, they it's like this. The, you can see when they're reds because they they're digesting something. So they're uh, the probably the most sought after species, and it's actually quite common, are the basket stars. Um, usually you can't, they're hard, much harder to see in the actual St. Lawrence River, but when you come in the Saguenay, especially if you're diving off the boat, you can see some really, really nice uh, specimens, some of them up to about a meter in diameter. And some sites are basically filled with them. And this is all on diver reachable depths versus, uh, I've seen videos of these where they're down hundreds of feet. Um, you know, oh, yeah. from other places. Oh yeah, totally. Um, like exactly why there's so, you know, we see them at a much shallower depth than the Saguenay versus the, the St. Lawrence River. I couldn't say with certainty. Personally, I'm leaning towards the fact that they're used to, to being in the dark. And since it's always, um, 
dark and the stagnant, much shallower depth. That's why we see them. That's just my idea. Uh, but they are really impressive. They actually move slowly. Unlike uh, an anemone, they're not going to stay stuck on the same place on the wall, for example. They can move slowly around and they're, all their arms basically are capture food and they, you'll see them arms slowly coil up and bring them into, their, into the, the central mouth right here. These are, these are really, really nice. We do have fish too. So my comparison with, you know, diving a coral reef kind of, you know, doesn't work as well when it comes to fish. So our fish tend to be all the same color, varying shades of browns, uh, except for, you know, a couple of species, but anything from small lump fish all the way to um, Atlantic wool fields, cod, stuff like that. We do have red fish, which is pretty much the only fish that shows any kind of color apart from brown and gray. Uh, the sea ravens and obviously the uh, the Atlantic wool feel. This one here, you can actually see it's uh, guarding its eggs. Atlantic wool fields are, wolf fields are interesting because they're um, they're actually going to stay coupled up. And I wouldn't quite say they're, they're monogamous, but they will only, generally we've only observed them mating and having and staying in in a pair and then guarding the eggs together. And the pairs tend to come back year after year to the to the same area. So we actually know where they are and we can go look at the eggs and see uh, see how they're doing. Starfish too. If you, you know, everybody likes starfish and we do have them. Starfish are also are one of the things where we have like the most colors too. Like I, I'm going to show you a few pictures later on of a really nice purple and orange ones. But those are, uh, uh, those, those can be seen as well. And obviously like these are all little, little examples when they're, they're, in, they're you know, by themselves, but they, they actually rarely are by themselves. When you put them all together, well, you have these amazing walls and sometimes the walls are just so filled with life that you actually can't see the granite that, you know, that, that, that makes up the wall. So looking like this, like you were gonna have walls that are just filled and it makes for a really impressive dive. So you could just spend a lot of time right in one spot, it looks like. If yeah, if you like, if you like <laughs> macro, like typically like for the photographers out there, um, you know, the Saguenay is, is generally known as a macro area. Um, not because there's nothing bigger to see, it's just because the, uh, it's, it's you know, much harder to light up landscapes when everything's dark. So, um, but if you do like just like looking at small critters, you can just park yourself in front of a wall and you know, stay there and gradually things just come alive and you start picking up movement left, right and center. And uh, you know, what looks like a wall, which has lots of, of you know, static features actually ends up have, being a wall with lots of static features and all kinds of teeny little animals living on there. So if you, here Jack, if you wanna roll the second video, Should have sound this time too. So this video was taken in various sites in the uh, in in the Saguenay, and we're going to see generally this, it's all macro shots. There's a few shots which have a bit of a wider angle to them. So here we see the, the comb jellies and the effect they have with um, when you shine your light on them. If you want to take pictures of them, the nicest thing is actually to shine your light indirectly. These are hydroids. With what appears to be nudibranch eggs on them. So nudibranchs really like eating these, so they're going to come up and they're with their eggs or they're just going to you know, munch on them. This is another kind of comb jelly. You can see that the cell is moving. That's how they they try to move around in the water. And these are all day dives right now? Yeah, we generally don't, we can, we dive at night sometimes, but you don't actually see anything different. Uh, if, we, if, we, if we're diving in stark outside, it's generally because of time constraints. Uh, because unlike in a normal, I would say dive, which has a day night cycle, in the Saguenay it doesn't make
Well, there's their little uh, bobtail squids. They're also called sepiolas. We have stuff like that in San Diego, but it's hard to get a shot. They're always moving around so much. Yeah, well, sepiolas, you actually have to you have to have a sharp eye to, to, um, to find them because they're generally quite static. There's our only octopus species. And as you can see, like you really have to, if you're just swimming by, you're not going to see it. You really have to see it. Right. So, this composition you see here with uh, uh, anemones, sponges, soft corals is quite typical of what we're going to see on a stagnate wall. And you said the octopus were small? Yeah, they're not like. If you're thinking like the like the, the the big red you know Pacific octopus that you see on the west coast, I mean, that's not how it works here. They're like at most are gonna they're gonna be a couple inches in diameter. Yeah, so it's incredible camouflage and then small. Yeah. So there we see like this is like a typical Sagna wall looks like this. So this one here is uh is a is an inverse wall, so it's actually almost upside down. So I was talk, talking about purple anemones. These are actually like same species, but different color variation. And you see that, that this is the typical sagging wall with the anemones, the sponges, soft corals, the basket stars. Um, and in all of that, like he, he, he stays, stays still and you just start looking a bit harder at you know the smaller things, you're gonna see all kinds of um, uh, little animals just come to life. Yeah, it's incredible how much stuff when the water's warm, you know, or warm or <laughs> cold. I mean, there's so much more life that you see moving around once you just pay attention to it. this again. Oh, sorry, I have to jump off. Yeah, <laughs> fast forward. Control all that. We didn't quite think that through. We should um, be. So one of the questions is because you have the, I mean, this is ha happens in caves also, but uh, so the question came up on because you have uh, fresh water and salt water, are you doing anything to compensate for the different buoyancy characteristics during your dive for that, or um, is it not? Well, we've had a couple of instances. You know, when you're weighted just so precisely for fresh water, where you know if you pick up, you know, uh, you know, if you had you know too much to eat before you dive, you just throw off your weighting, sort of thing. We've seen people actually bounce off the halo coin, so they could get the they could get below it. <laughs> Um, but I mean, we're talking, you know, you have to be really, 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 you know, borderline on your, on your weighting. Um, since the water's cold, uh, what we'd like, we're generally going to be diving with just enough weight to be able to add, you know, a nice amount of air to the dry suit to be comfortable. And uh, by the time you get to 30 feet and you get to that transition between the fresh water and the salt water, the suit's compressed enough and the undergarments have compressed enough that you can always play with that to compensate. So there's not a big difference. Mm -hmm. Like if you if you're if you're if you dive with your freshwater weights, usually you'll be fine. The yeah. biggest very the biggest issue we've had is people coming to dive and then not compensating correctly for the added undergarments for the dry suits. That's the right. bigger issue I'd say because the water is colder than what we most people coming from the outside are usually used to. So I would say that's a big thing to be worried about. Not you know bouncing off the hill of climb because you're, you're too light. Like, yeah, it's too light. You can always grab a rock too if that happens. So as far as like uh, the amount, because I mean, obviously, like I, I mentioned that I could spend my whole dive just right in that area in that photo that's behind you right now. Um, what's like on an average dive, are you guys really just kind of focusing on one area? Or are you guys traveling longer distances or? Um, Depends what you want to do. It's um, on the boat dives, usually usually like a dive site is, is big enough that we can drop uh, four, five, six teams 
of you know to and they'll uh, and they can be separate enough and some you know if we're if we're if we're if you're diving with a photographer well they're generally going to want to you know spend time at you know the same area to be able to spot all the things that are hard to spot uh, but if you want to you know travel around and be a tourist you can you can just you know fin slowly what i like doing is i like working with the current especially if you're diving from a boat because the boat's just going to follow the group of divers uh, that are drifting with the current and, you know, you just hover and let the current, you know, move you around and just, you know, appreciate the scenery. So when you're, when you're doing the shore dives, um, obviously a boat's following you, do you have to have like a, a surface marker buoy or a dive flag of some sort because of the boat traffic? The, uh, the boat like traffic, especially since you're launching from a boat launch area. Uh, although we, we launch from a boat launch, we don't dive from a boat beside a boat launch. So the, 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 the boat has all of the, uh, the dive flags, like the alpha flag, the dive flag that, that's required. And if there's, by the time we get to the dive site, there's not that much uh, boat traffic. The shipping lane that's in the mi middle of the fjord, the fjord is a couple of kilometers wide. So the shipping lane that's in the middle is actually, you know, over a kilometer from where the divers are actually diving. So although we do require divers to have a surface marker buoy in, in case they get separated, um, Usually what happens, especially if you're diving on an inverted wall, you, you don't want to deploy because then it's going to shoot up and bounce off the wall as it's going up and it's going to tear, you know, tear up all the stuff. So we have it on if you're separated, but usually if you stand by the wall and you gradually descend, well, then we're just going to spot all the, the divers at the surface. Okay. And then we can recover. So here, in addition to all of what we've seen, we actually have sharks too. But no, not that kind of shark. <laughs> we have Greenland sharks. That would be cool. But we don't actually see them when we're diving. Because oh. <laughs> they're, they're, they're way too deep. We know we have Greenland sharks because every couple of years, somebody pulls one up when they're ice fishing. Wow. So it doesn't happen too often. There's been 29 recorded cases of it happening since basically the beginning. Or that last one was in 2006, I believe. And it was pulled up from a depth of uh, 700 feet you know accidentally these things happen no they're not trying to fish sharks but i mean once you've played out 700 feet line you can't you don't really know what's hooked onto it um but That's yeah sad. so yeah this is unfortunate things happen if you want to see i believe that that one or the one before is actually stuffed in a museum right now hmm. what we will see above the water line though um are belugas so they're part of the dolphin family. They're white and they're an endangered species. So we have to, there, there's lots of restrictions with regards to operating a boat near them. So we can't actually go looking for belugas. We don't have the permits to do that. Uh, there's only a select few that do. Um, but if you're, you know, if you're on your surface interval and they, you know, they're free to wander wherever they want in the fjord. And if they decide to come by your boat, well, you just, you know, you're just there and you appreciate the show. We also have a few seals that you might see, and um, the plus you know, all the usual you know aquatic birds and whatnot that you might spot. So the belugas, they live in the Saguenay. They also live in the St. Lawrence River, and they're actually going to come here and they're going to have uh, uh, their their young basically. Can and you if, hear them? Can you hear them in the water at all? Uh, and all that you can stuff. hear if you're if you're in the river, you're gonna hear whales, humpback whales primarily. I've never actually heard the belugas though. I'd have to check. I know you can hear the whales, but that's more of a of a river thing. It's like the humpback whales don't quite come into the Sagni Fjord. So this is what they look like underwater. They're kind of somewhat similar similar to a manatee if you're you know from Florida. The, the head's not quite the same, but the the back end kind of looks like it, and they're white. So as you, there's obviously a really nice landscape if, you know, when sometimes you get these perfect days, like uh, my, like the background picture I had earlier, John, where, you know, it's got a perfectly blue skies, no wind, and it's just, you know, a lovely day to, just to be out on the boat. And if you gradually make your way, you know, down the fjord, eventually you're going to see it opens up to the river. You're going to see uh, the Prince Shoal Lighthouse, which is actually named after um, Queen Victoria's son, which 
came over and then ran aground this unmarked shoal back then. So they named the shoal after him, the lighthouse. And then you're, once you're there, you're officially, you know, in the St. Lawrence River. So this is gonna be the second part. So we have the part of the presentation. So this here is the fjord. And we can see the, sec the, the part of the St. Lawrence River is here. St. Lawrence River is really big. Um, like around here, it's a couple hundred kilometers in, in um, uh, the, the distance between shores a couple hundred kilometers. And basically saying, you know, I can't really talk about absolutely everything there is because we'd be here till tomorrow morning. So I'm mainly gonna focus on the sites we're gonna see on the Northern side of the, uh, uh, of, of the uh, of the estuary here. Not to say there's nothing on the southern sh side. If if you know if there's anybody who really likes wreck diving, well, right around Rimouski, well, there's you know a wreck that there's the Empress of Ireland which there was probably the, the most well-known wreck in the St. Lawrence River. Um, we might have somebody doing a deep dive DUI later on on that wreck. Hint, hint, Jack. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but we'll, if we talk about the the upper uh, area here. So here we have the uh, Prince Show Lighthouse right here. Sangley Fjord is right there. And now unlike the, um, unlike the fjord, this is just salt water. So we don't really have, the, we don't have halo clines. Uh, we're gonna have the regular day night cycle. And what we're gonna have, if you look at the, uh, in terms of water, there's obviously a very deep uh, portion right here. If you just look at the scale, we're talking about you know, 500 to 1,000 feet. So we're like, we're nowhere anywhere near that. We're mostly going to be the surface here. And you can see this is where we have a cold. It gives you an idea here. It's called cold intermediate layer. That's because the water here, regardless of the time of year, is generally quite cold. So, you know, it can be really, really hot. We can be in the middle of a heat wave. It might be 35, you know, degrees Celsius. So like close to 100 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface, lots of humidity. But the water is still going to be at two, three, four degrees Celsius. Obviously, the surface water might be a bit warmer, but by the time you get below 30, 40, 50 feet, you know, it's going to be cold regardless of the time of the year. Interesting thing to note here is that right before, just right where Prince Show Lighthouse is, the, um, the seafloor actually raises up sharply, and that causes lots of mixing between these different water layers. And this is what makes this environment so rich in food. That's why all the whales come. So just beside here, we have a, a little town called Tadoussac. And it's uh, pretty much the whale watching capital of Quebec. If you want to come right around fall, that's where you get to see all the humpback whales at the surface. And they're there because this area is just incredibly rich in food because of this mixing of various uh, layers here. So where do we dive? So again, again, you can dive from shore, you can dive from boat. When we're shore diving, like you can actually shore dive pretty much for the whole coast I showed you, which is, you know, well over a thousand kilometers long. There's two, if you're gonna come from the outside though, there's two spots that are reasonably close that really sp spring to mind. There's the first spot here, which is actually an official dive site. And uh, it's the um, Sande de Couverte des Milieux Marins. So it's basically a joint uh, Park Canada and uh, the FQAS, which is the Quebec Federation of Subaquatic Activities base. And you have a compressor there, there's dry suit rentals. And it's like, it's an official dive site. The shore, the shore access is actually really, really nice. There's nice ramps to go down and there's steps that are poured into the rock. You actually have lots of uh, gear in stations too. And it's a nice area if you want an easy shore dive, you can go there. There's an also, there's another area, which is this one here is privately owned, but they realized that it's, uh, you know, they can make money on divers. And it's actually a campground. So the Paradis Marin campground, and it's just a couple of kilometers before the, uh, the official dive base. And you can actually, if you have a tent, if you have uh, an RV or whatnot, you can actually just camp there. And they have an area which is dedicated to divers too, with a little boat ramp. If you have, if you're into kayaking or whatnot, you can bring your kayak there too and use the boat ramp. And they have a nice area, which is, which is uh, you know, an easy access to the water as well. If you're going to come for boat diving, well, there's two spots that really come to mind. If you look, there's, there is obviously the uh, the Escumain, which is where we were 
just a second ago with the shore dives. If you're willing to trek a bit more, a couple hundred kilometers more, you can go up to Big Comal where there's a really nice charter operator. I'm, I'm gonna leave his information at the end of the uh, conference who comes out. So there's two areas, other areas that are known for their diving, but the, you need to have a bit more logistical support there because there's no really fixed uh, diving charter operators, but it sets it right up here in the Zilmega, which are known for you know really, really nice diving conditions as well. So from the Eskumai, we're actually going to organize the uh, the boat charter. So this is our our mighty uh, boat. Kind of looks like a D-Day landing craft, but it makes <laughs> a really, really nice dive platform though. We just lower that, put the, the uh, ladder in there, and you're about six inches off the water. It's really easy, giant stride in the water, nice ladder to come up, come back to the surface, works out really well. So we organize those a couple times a year. And if you're going to go to Big Como, there's a uh, this charter operator in there. He's he knows his area really really well as well, and yeah, it's it's really good. It's really easy to get some really really amazing dives with him. So with a boat like that, do you have to worry about swell conditions or anything like that? Obviously, like we're, we're you're essentially like I mean th this well, this the... area right around here, mm -hmm. I would say is the size. I have to look up probably like the size of Lake Ontario easily. So like you can have, if the swell is really, really bad, well, you're obviously gonna get, you're gonna have to cancel the uh, the outing. Like personally with our operation, we're limited at four feet of swell. Don't wanna be diving four feet of swell though. <laughs> so like you, we try to focus uh, like the dive, you know, we try to target areas um, especially when you're in the river, since it's much, much uh, more open than the fjord. Uh, we try to avoid going there past uh, September because that's when the big fall winds start arriving. That's where the swell is really going to be problematic. <clears throat> so what is, what is there to see in the in the river? Well, obviously, it's pretty close to the Saguenay, so we're going to have lots of overlap in terms of species. There's a few species that don't venture into the Saguenay that are found in the river. There's a few species also in the Saguenay that you generally are much harder to find in the river. Uh, the cool, the big difference though, is the fact that now you have daylight to work with. So you're gonna be able to take advantage when you're you're diving the river during during the day of you know vast underwater landscapes because you don't need 10,000 lights to, to light up a, a whole dive site. Um, another thing you're going to get in the river that you're not going to get in the Saguenay is anything that needs light to survive, like various species of, you know, seaweeds. So anything that does uh, photosynthesis can't live in the Saguenay because it's always dark. So we are going to have, you know, much more aquatic plants in the river than what we're going to see in the Saguenay. And obviously, since we are not dealing with the, the, the brown fresh water, we're going to start seeing waters that are have somewhat of a greenish tint, depending on when you are during the, um, what time of the year you are. Uh, so that changes from the somewhat brownish tint you're gonna see when you're in the upper layers of the, of the Saguenay. So obviously what you're we're gonna see is the same general crustaceans. So lots of crabs, whether they be spider crabs, common crabs, um, snow crabs. What we're also gonna see are lobsters, which we generally don't see in the Saguenay. So as you work out closer to the Gulf of the St. Lawrence, you're gonna start seeing more and more lobsters. Obviously you can't take them out of the water. So there's no such thing as lobster hunting in Quebec. So it's a, you need to have the federal license to do that. And only the lobster fishermen are allowed to do that with their traps. Uh, lots of sponges and soft corals like this. Lots of starfish. There are starfish in the Saguenay, but I find that if you, starfish are your thing, you want to go to the river because that's where you're going to see just a whole pile of them. Various, all their kinds, different shapes, sizes, number of legs, you know, you name it, we have it. These are my wow. favorite ones. It's a cool color. Yeah, my daughters really like them. Then again, it's a marine park, so you can't take things out of the water. Uh, lots of anemones, like 
we have lot, there's lots of anemones in the Saguenay. I find though that the, the general gardens of, you know, Plumies anemones that you see, sort of like what you see on the West Coast too, that's more of a river thing. But we do have like generally the, the same species of, of anemones are gonna be found in, in both areas. We have fish. Uh, so the wolf eels are gonna be common to both spots. What you're not gonna see, what is much harder to see in the Saguenay is schools of fish, primarily because generally they're not gonna be close to you. They're gonna be a bit further out in the open water and you generally just don't have the range with your light to see them. So in the river, you do, you do can, like you will spot them occasionally. Um, so this is just a big blunt fish right there and our famous wolf fields. Yeah. Jellyfish and negacy butterflies like this. These are nice. These only come for a couple of weeks during the year, during truly the mid-season. They're about eh, a couple of inches long and they're found really near the surface. You really have to keep an eye out for them. And obviously on the surface, you know, we talked about belugas and the Saguenay. You're not going to see them as much in the river um, but you will see lots and lots of whales. So humpback whales primarily. Occasionally you're going to have blue whales that are going to come in. Uh, and those, you generally will not see them while you're diving, but you can if you, if you just, you know, stop breathing for a second. If you're lucky enough, you can hear them underwater. So when is it the best time to come? Um, you don't want to come right after winter, uh, during springtime because, uh, we get, we get lots of snow, uh, although we didn't get a whole lot this year, but usually we have a couple of feet of snow. So, you know, by the, when all that melts, it generates a lot, lots of water. So that's going to create lots of big influx of sediment inside the, uh, you know, both the Saguenay and the St. Lawrence river. And that's basically mean your visibility is going to be, you know, rotten. So you want to wait till, you know, basically, you know, late spring at the earliest, but ideally you want to wait till midsummer. So right around say mid July, all the way to August, that's the best, especially if you want to do any boat diving, because generally we have calm winds. So, you know, the, the risk of being uh, blown out is quite low. Uh, and you can actually come in September, October, or November, although the boat generally won't be out. The shore diving is really good. What just the, the water temperature, it's going to get slightly colder. Uh, the big change is going to be on the surface temperatures though. Whereas August, we might, we might have some really comfortable temperatures that are in the mid, you know, 20 degrees Celsius, which is, I guess, what 70s, the 80s Fahrenheit. Um, by the time, you know, end of September and October rolls in, well, we're in the, you know, sometimes the single digits at the surface. And when you're coming out of water, that's, uh, uh, you know, that's around, you know, freezing or a bit more, well, you know, it, it sometimes sucks to have, you know, cloudy overcast day and no sun and it's just cold on the surface too. You know, all your hands are freezing and it's trying to get all your gear apart. So, I mean, if you have, you know, if you could find it in you and you have lots of motivation to come, you know, and uh, dive, well, sure, the diving conditions are great. The water is cold, visibility is amazing. Most of the divers have gone away, so you have the dive sites to yourself. But, I mean, it's not going to be a little more miss, especially on the surface. Obviously, by the time winter comes, uh, not a whole lot of diving anymore because of the ice, which leads us to the last little bonus part of the presentation. You know, what do we do during winter? Now, we can do what most people do, which is go dive here, right? But I mean, or you can do the obvious choice, which is to dive here under the ice. Right. <laughs> So your, your profile photo that we had uh, promoting this, uh, it, was, it was an awesome photo because it's, your suit's all frozen. You're wearing it while you're snowmobiling to the site. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, we had, we had to dive in a lake that was, that, that was you know, kind of remote. So we, we had to gear up, you know, assemble all the stuff beforehand. And we had to snowmobile about, what was it? three, four kilometers, so, you know, two, two, two miles to the, uh, to the site. I mean, that, that's fine when you're, you're dry, right? <laughs> so you, you dive after that. And I know I, that's, that's a CF 200. So obviously when you come out of the water, it's not dry. And uh, by the time, you know, you snowmobile back while well, you're, you know, it was body armor. Yeah. So I, 
I actually had to, to boil up some water to thaw out the, the, the external zipper because it was, and the little buckle for the cross strap because <laughs> that thing was just frozen. Yeah. yeah those are the joys of, you know, winter diving, right? So why is ice diving special? Ice diving is fun. It's, it's a logistically intensive activity uh, just because you have to cut the hole and all that stuff. And that, you know, that's a couple of hours of work right there. Um, it's interesting because it's pretty much the only recreational diving you can do in a truly overhead environment. Um, and the way we do that, when you, you approach it from a recreational point of view is that we use um, basically a line to the surface and at the surface there's each, each diver has a tender. And that's what, you know, most agencies, that's what, you know, the agencies have determined to be uh, the safe way, I guess, to approach this kind of diving, overhead diving from a recreational perspective. You can also approach it from a, you know, technical perspective if you have a background in cave diving or, you know, advanced rec with penetration diving and you could treat it like you would in those situations there with like redundant gas supply lines and whatnot. But, you know, the basic of, of ice diving and what I would say 95% of all ice diving is, it's basically a recreational setting with lines going up to the surface. And it's lots of fun um, because it allows you to see something you don't usually see. Like usually when we dive, we're focusing on what's at the bottom. And you can do that if you're, if you're ice diving, especially if you're ice diving a new site. Um, I think one of the most beautiful parts of ice diving though is not what's at the bottom, but it's actually what's at the surface. It's just looking at the ice. I mean, when yeah. you look at a frozen lake, what's that? No, I was just saying that it's the lights, reflections and all that is incredible. Oh yeah, yeah, it is. When you look at a frozen lake from the surface, it looks pretty, you know, it's white, it looks like a white field. When you look at it from underwater, you realize that, you know, the complexity that's in the different kinds of ice that were formed because at you know different rates, different temperatures, outdoor temperatures, if the ice is clear, if it has lots of little air bubbles inside, and that makes for all kinds of really interesting play on light. Another thing you can do, which is which is really fun when you're ice diving, and that takes a bit more practice. And I'm gonna have Jack roll the video. Oh yeah. Okay. It's basically, you know, flip the world upside down. I 
having some communication issues. I remember though, people think of ice diving, oh, the water must be cold. Like, you know, this is fresh water, and there's fresh water can, can only get so cold, right? It freezes at zero degrees Celsius at 32 Fahrenheit. And so it can't get any cooler than that. And most of the time, you know, the water, obviously, not when you're that close to the ice, but when you're a bit closer to the bottom, is going to be at four degrees, which is the same temperature, which is going to be under the thermal climb during the summer, too. So it's not actually that cold when you're in the water. The coldest part of ice diving is actually on the surface. So when the, because uh, for every diver you see underwater, there's somebody else holding the line on the surface. And there's also safety divers. So that's all these people who are, you know, freezing themselves on the surface just so you can enjoy your, uh, your half an hour, 45 minutes of, uh, ice diving right and when you do that well you have to keep in mind that you know everything that goes around comes around right it'll be your turn too right <laughs> yes yeah, you're your smart you, you know you want to make sure your time at the surface is um when you're dry not when your dry suit's wet yeah let's go back to the uh go back to yours yeah back to me okay And yeah, I've got to figure out a way to zip by to the end without. So how many times or how long did that uh, take to shoot that? <laughs> was that all in one dive or is that after multiple uh, tries? That scene was, was well, there, there was lots of practice involved. It, it took a couple of, of tries to get the everything working correctly. Oh, don't I think that. I saw another video like that where the, where someone's he has a wheelbarrow and he's walking around with it. <laughs> yeah, we 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 uh, we tried that one year too. I mean, there's you know that's not new filming yourself underwater like that, but it is fun. You will you know if you're the kind of person who gets motion sickness though, I mean, you gotta watch out. So if you want to come and uh, hang out with us in the Sagne and the uh, St. Lawrence River. Well, I should say you definitely should. It's lots of fun. There's a few things you want to keep in mind, though. The first thing, we're in Quebec. What does that mean? Quebec um, likes to do things differently. So you actually need a permit from the, essentially, the government to come diving here, even if, you don't, if you're not a resident. Uh, if you're just coming in as a, uh, as a tourist, it's not really complicated. It's a $5 affair, Canadian dollars. So like a dollar US and um, it's good for 30 days. It's just paperwork basically. Uh, but you do want to, you know, keep that in mind. Second thing, water is cold. Uh, so you want to keep that in mind in terms of uh, undergarments. There's a few people who claim that you can do this kind of diving in wetsuits. And while it's true, you can, the second <laughs> dive really sucks. Um, especially if you're on a boat, with at least an hour of surface interval in a really open area where it might be a bit windy. Um, so, I mean, dry suits are strongly, strongly suggested for shore diving and like we require them for boat diving because the risk of hypothermia is just too great on the surface between dives with a wetsuit. Um, in terms of, in terms of uh, gear too, um, Dry suit undergarment. If you're going to come to Saguenay, you need lights, so primary light, backup light. It doesn't have to be a $5,000 affair, uh, but you do want to have nice, reliable lights uh, just because, you know, they are an essential piece of gear when you're diving in the Saguenay, just because it's always, it's just so dark. In terms of training, uh, the Saguenay is advanced open water, minimum. 
And don't forget, like they're mostly, they're pretty much, if especially if you're coming on the boat, they're going to be wall dives and there might not be a bottom for, you know, several hundred feet. So in addition to having an open water, you know, being open, an open water diver, you want to make sure that, you know, your buoyancy is, is, is solid because, you know, the buoyancy is going to be, you know, the last thing you're going to want to have to worry about when there's 700 feet of water below you. Uh, there might not actually be anything on the wall for you to grab onto, depending on the, uh, how the wall's built. And even if there is something, you know, there's lots and lots of living things. It's a national park. The environment is really fragile too. Like lots of these animals are really fragile. So you don't want to be grabbing onto them and breaking them and hurting them. Uh, the St. Lawrence is slightly easier. It's an open water dive. Um, but I mean, some of the conditions can be harsher. Uh, we do have currents, we have tides. We've, just to give you an idea, we've clocked currents up to six knots in the Saguenay. Uh, so if you like drift diving, you can have, you know, some pretty ripping drift dives. And even though, you know, there are some, you, you can do, and we've done, done for the longest time, open water checkout dives at the Eskuma in the, in the St. Lawrence River. You know, just by respect for the environment and the fact that, you know, it still is a national park, there's lots of wildlife there that's fragile. You know, you want to make sure that you don't, you know, break everything and you, and you just leave the sites in you know, the same conditions you found them in. The last thing you, you want to have is basically time. You know, unfortunately, we're far away. Uh, if you're coming in from Montreal, it's a five hour drive. If you're coming in from the Ontario area, it's you know, anywhere from seven, eight to 12, 14 hours. If you're coming in from the States, it might be even longer than that. So uh, if you want to, it really, it really sucks to be rushed especially if you're coming in when there's a risk of be having to, to delay your dives or, you know, delay into the next day. So being able to have a few days is nice. And there's also lots of things to do around here that aren't diving. So if you're into hiking, biking, uh, climbing, there's all kinds of stuff to do here. If you have nice cruises on the, on the, on the fjord, there's cruises on the river. If you're coming in during fall, it's whale watching season two. So there's tons of stuff to do. Uh, so if you want to do come over, I highly suggest you plan the time not to be, uh, not to be, um, rushed. So I hope you've enjoyed your time. I haven't bored you too, too much. Uh, I'd like to really thank, uh, Isanne Delandre and Patrick Bourgeois. They're the ones who took pretty much all those, the pictures and the videos. Patrick Bourgeois is actually the owner operator of that charter in Bécomo and his coordinates are going to be at the end, uh, that the end screen that Jack is going to put up. And thank you, Jack, for hosting this event. Yeah, no, thanks. Fun. Yeah, thanks for coming out. I mean, it's always, you know, as uh, as people are hopefully finding out that uh, I am kind of setting these things up for places I would like to go visit and go dive because <laughs> um, I want to make it to all these different places. And I love seeing the different um, areas and ways people are diving and what they have in their local environments. And you don't always have to travel to some exotic location. Um, you know, like myself, I went to recently, I just went to Maui. Um, <laughs> I still don't have a drive suit. So <laughs> anyways, I, well, water's yeah, I, cold in Hawaii, eh? What? Water's yeah, cold that, in Hawaii. Yeah. Oh, it was, yeah. It was, yeah. It was on the boat, on a boat dive. They're all like, Oh, dry suit, a little bit too much. And then as I come up after everybody else was sitting on the boat for a while, they're all, they're all shivering, wrapped in towels. I'm like, going, oh, that's a great dive, wasn't it? <laughs> and I go right for the snacks. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I love hearing about all, all the different places, what you're seeing um, and just uh, and want to encourage people to get out and dive. There's so much to do out there. You don't have to go, um, you know, some grand vacation. Sometimes it's right there in your backyard, like right where you are, mm -hmm. little, farther drive um not quite as close as my 15 minutes but <laughs> uh, but you have a an awesome place to go dive that's right there so uh, that's awesome yeah totally we're, we're really lucky to have that in our somewhat uh, we, we could call it our backyard say we had a really large backyard but um yeah, no, it's, it's much closer than having to take, you know, a couple hour plane ride to go down south and dive in, you know, Bonaire or uh, Cuba or Roatan. Right. So I, I got a message here. That you're supposed to talk about the craft beer. <laughs> yes, totally. Yeah, there's, you know, in addition to nice to activities that are healthy for you, we also have activities that are less so healthy for you. So tons of craft beer. 
we also have if you're if you're into cheese curds we have the best cheese curds in the world uh, better than have, wisconsin right? what's that better than wisconsin <laughs> oh yeah totally <laughs> but we, we can we actually deep fry them too and we stick them on poutine and that's just great <laughs> not i mean it, it, it's good for us because it makes people have to need new dry suits because they don't fit in their previous dry suits anymore <laughs> but it's uh it, it's, it's really good but yeah like lots lots of you know nice places to go visit craft beer um blueberries too we're a huge producer of blueberries we mix both of them you can have some nice blue, blueberry flavored craft beer too like the craft beer industry has really exploded in the past decade or so and there's like so many right now it's hard to to name them all yeah uh yes people always call it and they go oh my dry suit trunk <laughs> yeah um, it's like well <laughs> i don't really shrink <laughs> um anyways but thank you for coming out um, and doing this and taking the time. I know you put a lot of work into this. Um, so it's, it's definitely something that I'm going to get to eventually one of these days. So, um, and fill out that paperwork for a dollar. <laughs> yeah, five, well, five Canadian dollars. Yeah, um, but it's, it's definitely something that looks, looks like I, I, I need, just like those earlier uh, photos and videos, I mean, I could drop in the one spot and just stay there the whole dive and people will go, you didn't see anything. I'm like, no, I probably saw way more than you did traveling however far you went because I just stopped and looked in one place and found mm -hmm. everything that you could see in that area. So, yeah. And it's the like you mentioned earlier, you don't have to go down super deep. Like most of the nice stuff is in the 50 to 80 foot range. You, you can go down deeper if you want. You're just going to see the same things. Mm -hmm uh so it's great you know it's, it's a great depth to have a nice long dive so when, when you have a nice you know dry suit that's when the warm undergarments like we usually your planner dives around the hour mark so mm -hmm. we'll stay underwater for an hour and uh come back up and even an hour that's just because it's, it makes for easy planning but you can easily stay down for an hour and a half if you have you know the the tank size and you're not cold and there's still stuff to see so just uh i know that you've at at dema through the years we've always talked about heated undergarments um mm -hmm. and just to let you know it is uh we are making steps towards that again with the next version of the blue heat um just so people who are watching there are familiar with it um the version one has been discontinued or phased out um but through a military contract that we uh are completing or finishing um that was a it was kind of like one of those i guess the military has competitions um so we were awarded the the contract for that and we're finishing up on that once that's finished we're going to make a less complicated recreational version um so we're looking forward to a more efficient um heated undergarment coming out in the future um so but again in, do in you want we're not future. What? Uh, in the near future. It nearer than it was when we first talk, started talking about this a couple of years ago. <laughs> um, so it's so in the sense of there's actually electronics, you know, being produced right now for the military contract um, where before it was all on paper type of thing. So mm -hmm. there's actually physical products being tested and and being used right now. So much, much closer. Um, so it's. It'll be exciting. Um, uh, you maybe need do like a little, maybe a modified version where it's maybe just a heated vest too. Um, so we're working on all sorts of different things because we've made the electronics so small um, mm -hmm. that and the power consumptions uh, improved to a point where it's makes it very mobile compared to what we had before. Obviously, that big huge canister was huge. All right. Um, so now it's just way more efficient you can always send a few to our way right we're going to test them <laughs> yeah for sure i mean you guys are on the <laughs> list <laughs> so anyways um let's wrap this up we've we've gone over our, our hour mark um so thank you again for coming out um this is great and no worries my pleasure and uh and eventually you can do another presentation on some of the other wrecks or other places to go dive because someone asked a question about uh something pigeon i lost it in my notes here
the pigeon or something like that. I don't know where I saw that. Anyway, um, I'm sure there's other other things you can talk about and diving in your area. Um, but what we have coming up in the future, uh, we will have some a presentation on the coral reef restoration project going on in Florida um, and some other interesting topics coming up in the future. So if you know of people that want to present here or talk about what they have, um, we welcome it. Uh, just go ahead and send me an email. Um, we'll get this all set up. And again, I will, I'm going to uh, share the screen with the information about uh, that has some of your links and I will also post them on, on Facebook. Um, so they'll be clickable from there. And then check back on the YouTube channel because the videos will be posted there. And of course, once we end this, all the videos will be instantly replayable via Facebook. So thanks everyone uh, for coming out and we'll see you next month. Yeah, thanks everyone. So let's go ahead and I'm going to, sorry, it always takes me a while to figure out where I move things around. I can remove the spotlight. Okay, I'm back up here and share my screen. Not with computer sound this time. And there we go. So there's the information guys and we'll see you guys next month. So thanks for coming out.